the 29th of April, a child was born, Muhammad, in the family of Amina, the widow of Abdullah. She was a poor woman without any type of economic means or fixed income. Abdullah died shortly before the birth of Muhammad. Amina, for being very poor, sought help and found refuge with Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Muhammad, who was a generous man, although he had gone through some economic difficulties too. This situation was very difficult for the mother and her son. Amina couldn't feed her son except for just a few weeks and had to look for a Bedouin wet nurse by the name of Halima bin Zueb, who was very poor and lived in the valley of desert. Halima took care of and loved Muhammad. She nursed him, tried to give him good food and played with the poor child who had lost his father and was separated from his mother. She tried to keep him happy every way that she could, but because she was poor, she couldn't give him everything what he wanted. When he turned five years old, Amina, the mother of Muhammad, came back, longing for him. Halima, although sad, understood the feelings of Amina and gave the child back to his mother. A short time later, Amina got sick and died, leaving Muhammad an orphan at six years of age. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, stayed with him, but when Muhammad turned eight years old, his grandfather also died, once again leaving him all alone. His uncle, Abu Talib, took him in to live with him. He was also very poor and had a very large family. Muhammad, in order to help sustain the family, had to work as a shepherd, a clerk in the store, collector and helper in caravans. Normally, at eight years of age, most children are having fun, playing and don't even have to worry about problems or difficulties of any kind. However, Muhammad, as a poor child, had to work hard and face many difficulties. Growing up in this kind of difficult situation brought him great sadness, feelings of loneliness and lack of self-esteem. When he used to see other children of his age, he felt very sorry and longed for his parents. He thought and wished that he too could have a father who would play with him, take him for walk and buy him toys. Oh, how he wished he had a mother to love him, care for him, give him hugs and kisses and to take care of him when he was sick, to feed him and cry for him when he's hurt. The poor child would just go to the corner to cry because there wasn't anyone to whom he could express his feelings. It is doubtful that anyone can take care about, love or understand us like our own parents. Although he lived with his uncle, he didn't have many freedoms and was constantly mistreated. His aunt treated him very badly. She frequently hit him and when it came time to eat, she treated him in a very derogatory manner, saying, Besides the fact that I have such a big family, I also have to feed this trash? Muhammad listened in silence and endured everything without understanding why he was to blame, why he had to face such a cruel situation. In his heart, a volcano of vengeance, anger and resentment began to erupt towards his situation against the world and especially against women because of the abuse he had received from his aunt. This difficult situation in the majority of cases causes a child to be distracted and have low self-esteem. 
Muhammad realized that he was an orphan without a future and the world revolved around money and power. But for the moment, he had no other option but to continue living with his uncle's family. No one is born a criminal, neither does anyone want to live like one. Delinquency in the majority of the cases is a consequence of a life filled with difficulties and deficiencies. This poor child was raised in this situation, little by little causing him to think like a criminal. At 20 years old, he left his uncle's family since he already had made many friends. So he left to live life on his own. He felt prepared to begin his new life and to become successful as he had many times dreamed. He always said to his friends, one day I'll be a king and I'll rule the whole world. Everyone will respect me, whether because they love me or because they fear me. It really doesn't matter. Besides the fact that he didn't have a single penny in his pocket, his anger kept him full of energy and pushed him with an unstoppable force. He didn't want to continue his life as just a worker. He wanted to be rich and powerful. But how? What did you have to do to be rich and powerful? Muhammad didn't have any money to invest into a business, nor family that could support him financially so that he could better his standard of living. The dream of becoming rich and powerful without any money in his pocket and without a roof over his head, it was almost impossible to become true. After some time passed, Muhammad formed a group of young people who were almost in the same situation like him. They accepted him as their leader and administrator. They began to plan ways to become successful. Muhammad's strategy was very clear. Success, power and money at whatever price. And it didn't matter what had to be done to obtain this objective. They studied and investigated all of the options. They realized that Jews and Christians who were very rich and powerful in politics, religion and society governed the world. They should be attacked, robbed and taken away their money. Having money in your pocket, power would come by itself. But how to do that? To go into their houses and rob them wouldn't be easy because there were many of them and they would respond in the same violent way. So they decided to rob them when they could catch them alone in the streets, the desert or their stores covering their faces with a veil. In the next five years, Muhammad's group became very violent, attacking and robbing Jews and Christians. They assaulted them, beat them, and if they resisted, they would even kill them. Words like sympathy, love, and friendship didn't exist in the dictionary of Muhammad's life. For him, everything was a question of how he could obtain it all. They would grab them on the pathways and in the streets of the towns, except for in Mecca, where they didn't usually act. Everything was a question of having someone to scout out of the movements of the Christians and Jews and waiting for the rest to act. Muhammad was happy with his success during these five years, but he wasn't completely satisfied because he hadn't yet reached the point of where he wanted to be. Almost everything went towards the cost of maintaining the group. There wasn't much left over for him. He couldn't assault the people every day. That is why he also had to work in a company in Mecca so that no one would suspect him about his activities. He was worried for his future 
and began to think about how to develop a new strategy in order to climb the ladder higher in his profession of robbing the rich people in order to become more powerful. While continuing to search for the best way to become even more rich and raise his standard of living, at the age of 25, Muhammad met Khadija, his boss at the job he had in Mecca, a wealthy widow who was 40 years old, 15 years older than him. This was just the opportunity that he needed. To Muhammad, neither age nor love mattered when it came to climbing a ladder of success. He just wanted to forget about it all. For him, love or relationships were not as important as power and money. All the difficulties and problems that he faced as a child had made him very cold and cruel. So that is how Muhammad began his courtship with this woman. His youth and longing for Khadija to make her feel loved again made it an easy task. Muhammad married for the first time to the 40 years old merchant lady. Muhammad's objective in the marriage was to have a life filled with luxury and fun and taking advantage of Khadija's wealth, creating a firm base for his plan to achieve success. It was the perfect plan to continue raising his standard of living. But he didn't leave his group. That continued to be an important concern in his life. Once he married Khadija and had a lot of money, Muhammad changed his lifestyle. Now he could travel wherever he wanted, manipulate influences and continue to expand his group of criminals. Everything that was not accessible to him before, he now had in the palm of his hands. Muhammad continued his progress, creating new plans for his future. Where he had finally arrived wasn't even near the end. Muhammad wanted to fly to the heavens and govern the whole world. So he made his group of young delinquents even larger including many young people who came on their own accord to ask for a job, being that Muhammad was a very famous mafia man and contracted them to steal and kill. They began to exercise violence unnecessarily in their conduct without feeling any fear. He was going very well just like he wanted. To see that everyone feared him, made him more happy each time and gave him confidence. Muhammad spread his mission to the rest of the Arab world, to all the important cities and had his groups working for him in all regions. Because of this, it became the greatest mafia movement of that time. Nearing the age of 40, he had great power, thousands of people working for him, stealing from the rich Christians and Jews. All of the poor delinquent and uneducated people became part of Muhammad's group since it was an easy way to get money and escape their misery. Now they didn't just steal, they went a step further. They raped women and killed all of the Jews and Christians who resisted Muhammad's soldiers. They took their women as slaves and tortured and raped them. They were the most horrific mafia group of that time. All of a sudden, Muhammad realized that the people had more fear than respect for him. And that the thousands of people who stole and raped women at his command were not going to obey him for the rest of their lives. So what would he have to do in order to achieve the final step of governing the entire world? What would he have to do in order to be respected forever so that they would do whatever he told them to? Muhammad saw how the Jews and Christians were respected and were very strong economically, politically and religiously. The entire world followed them and they received a lot of money for religious reasons. For this reason, Muhammad liked 
the idea of creating his own faith, although it was a false one. Muhammad's dream had always been to govern the world. He saw that it was not very difficult to teach the uneducated and poor people a new faith. And for those who didn't accept his faith, they would be obligated by force or threats, putting to good use his thousands of soldiers, mafia criminals and assassins. Now the question was to figure out the steps to obtain this objective of how to create a false faith and make everyone in the world to follow it. Muhammad planned every detail with his group of counselors. They wanted to create a faith that would give complete power to the followers and force the people to convert. In this way, power would be granted to kill those who didn't want to believe his faith with a very clear message of one faith and one God placing Muhammad as the ultimate and most praiseworthy prophet of God. Thus, the followers would have the right to make war against all those who didn't follow him. Muhammad wanted to give complete and legal power to his team of thieves and assassins to rob and kill all Christians and Jews that they wanted to and thus be able to govern the world without any opposition. In the town of Mecca, the people still knew him as Khadija's husband. But outside of Mecca, Muhammad was famous for being a violent mafia, thief and killer. This adding the fame of the city as the well-known major religious center brought him to make the decision of using Mecca as the epicenter of his religious and principal destination of the followers of his self-created upcoming faith. Although Muhammad really wanted to declare himself as the god of his new faith, he knew that it wouldn't be very easy to convince the people that a man could have converted into God. So from the suggestions of his team, he decided to be a prophet, which would grant him absolute power. They investigated everything needed to create a faith. A God, a prophet, a religious book, a sacred house of God, and many followers. Amongst many opinions and ideas, they chose some that everyone agreed would be perfect. They decided to establish an entire system for this new faith which they would impose on the world. The Prophet of the New Faith They decided to declare that Muhammad would be the ultimate, most honorable and most important Prophet of Allah. And they decided it this way so they could grant Muhammad all power just as the God himself. The followers of this new faith would be called Muslims. And according to Islam, they would be the best humans in the world. That the world had been created solely for them and that only Muslims would reach heaven. In this way, Muhammad gave all rights to Muslims with the purpose that they could use violence commit injustice or whatever hidden act in the name of this new faith in order to spread itself throughout the whole world and obtain more power for Muhammad. The religious book that they created would be called the Quran which would speak of and demonstrate the superiority of Muhammad. Through this book they would deceive and convince the entire world using messages and teachings that were in favor of the purposes of Muhammad and his gang of criminals. The easiest way that Muhammad found for creating this book was to copy parts of the Bible and the Torah. Thus, taking the contents of these sacred books, Muhammad created his own book giving it the name Quran. the sacred home of the new faith. They decided that Mecca would be the house of God where all of the world would visit. 
and they would receive many offerings in order to raise up the kingdom of Muhammad. They decided to declare by means of false messages from Allah that through Muhammad the ultimate, most honorable and important prophet of Allah, all of the world would have to conduct their lives how Muhammad conducted his. And upon doing so, it was called Sunnah. And those who adopt this behavior will have a more direct path to glory. Like that, Muhammad pretended to be more and more strong, becoming himself the model to follow for all of his faithful ones. Muhammad decided to design an official and legal site for his followers, where, with the excuse of needing to pray, they could plan wars and black market activities. They gave the name to the site, Mosque which now exists all around the world. Muhammad and his followers planned all the human massacres behind half-closed doors of the mosque. And now, the Islamic terrorists of the modern world are following the same steps of Muhammad inside these mosques in order to destroy the peace of the world. Lastly, it became an obligation of every believer to participate in the holy war, Jihad, in the name of Allah, the God created by Muhammad. It was a well thought out plan with the purpose that Muhammad and his followers could get everything that they wanted. When the town of Mecca heard about Islam and Muhammad as Prophet, in the beginning nobody wanted to listen to him or believe him. It wasn't so easy going out on the street proclaiming to the world the existence of a new faith and a new prophet. A faith is not a typical plate of Arabic food that you just prepare in an hour. But Muhammad's wife helped him greatly to take the message to the whole town and convince the people of it. Also, thousands of people from Muhammad's criminal team converted to Islam falsely in public to show the people of the town that there had been a revolution, that Allah had sent his true messenger to this world and that he had chosen Mecca as his holy place. Muhammad's wife and his team very subtly and cleverly bribed the poor and the beggars, giving them money, food and other primary necessities so that they would accept Islam as true religion and Muhammad as prophet. Thus, Muhammad increased the quantity of people who adopted his false faith. Muhammad began to triumph when he began converting his friends and those closest to him to Islam. He convinced them saying that all the messages that he received were words from Allah. In each message of this God, his own name was always mentioned so that the whole world would realize that how important he was for Allah, but told the world that he went to the cave to receive words from Allah, to see the angels of Allah, to meditate and pray to Allah. This process continued for several years, until Muhammad fabricated many false messages of a God which did not exist, and later mixed those messages with the contents that he had copied from the Bible and the Torah. All these messages were contained in the book called Quran, created by Muhammad to deceive the people of Mecca, the Arab world and humanity. Everything was going like Muhammad wanted. His strategy was triumphing. The people under the command of Muhammad continued robbing, raping and killing innocent people outside of their town. And in his own town, he pretended to be the Prophet of Allah. Arabs of Mecca were clinging to their polytheism and others, Christians and Jews, revolted against the Prophet. The most powerful families of Mecca turned against him. The Christian and Jewish communities of Mecca were provoked and outraged for the impetuous activities of Muhammad. 
he began to be hindered by the Christian and Jewish communities which knew that Muhammad was a liar and that there wasn't any Allah or a prophet of Allah. Problems began to arise when Muhammad began to insult other religions. The Jews and the Christians didn't let him just come into their communities easily to preach the false messages. That is why Muhammad had to use violence and power from the Mafia against those who became obstacles in his way. Finally, for fear of Muhammad, the other communities decided not to confront him to prevent problems with him and his Mafia group. And this allowed Muhammad to practice his new faith wherever he wanted. Now Muhammad was searching for a way to make possible conversion of Christians and Jews to Islam with tricks, lies, force and threats. Muhammad added new messages to the Quran and shared them with the whole world. For example, I have been ordered by Allah to fight against all the unfaithful until they submit to the reality that there is no God except for Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Submit and testify that there is no other God except Allah and Muhammad is his apostle or you will be decapitated. In summary, according to the message of Allah, Muhammad transmitted it to the world through the Quran. I order all Muslims to fight against the unfaithful until they are dead or convert to Islam. Permit people of other faiths to live freely and ignore Islam was not an option. The following years were barbaric and violent. Muhammad forced the Christians and Jews to convert to Islam or die by the sword. Muhammad and his followers abused their women and seized their properties. The barbarism of Muhammad didn't distinguish between youth, elders and children. Everyone became the victim of the sword of Muhammad. It left women as widows, children as orphans, very mistreated physically and psychologically. Muhammad subjected the Arab children to the same situation that he had suffered from in his childhood without parents. Because of Muhammad, a huge part of the population cried for the rest of their lives from deep horror and suffering. Those who didn't want to convert to Islam and wanted to follow their own religions were obligated to live under the submission of the government of Muhammad and were forced to pay him quantities of money periodically so that they would be allowed to continue living. Thus, the people of other religions were forced to pay a tax to Muhammad called Jaziya under Islamic laws. The resounding success of his strategy attracted various mafia groups from other towns and Arab countries. Some groups from the Arab city of Medina invited him to negotiate about how they could join Muhammad's group. This offer was enough attractive for Muhammad because he needed more manpower and political alliances with various groups in order to continue the plan of flying his flag throughout the world. Muhammad and his Mafia alliances reached an agreement of sharing the power, but only under one condition, according to what? The world will be governed under Muhammad's flag. And then, from Medina, a new story was began. The religion that was created by Muhammad was at the point of expanding internationally, with many plans of war, violence, and Islamic military action. Muhammad and his followers initiated the offense against passive countries in order to impose Islam on them using force, violence and eliminating their enemies. This launched the holy war against Christian, Jewish and polytheistic paganism. 
This war cost countless lives in various communities, cities, countries, and amongst people of different types of faith. Up to this time, it hadn't been possible to make a true list of all the massacres that Muhammad had committed in his ambition for power. They are countless. But some of the most important wars and attempts against humanity that Muhammad did were the following. The War of Badr. The War of Uhud. The War of Azab. The War of Hunayn. The War of Tabuk. The War of Muta. These wars caused the worst human massacres in the history of our humanity. It began with Medina, passing through Mecca to the entire Arab world, conquering many countries and making them submit under his flag, and reaching countries of almost the entire world. So much success and wealth made Muhammad too cruel and shameless. His feet were not on the ground. He was flying in the clouds of his own world, created by lies and violence. The palace of his life was full of happiness and the luxuries that he constructed over the dead bodies of thousands of innocent victims. And it made him feel like a god that could control the whole world by moving just one finger. From being an orphan to becoming a thief, afterwards a mafia assassin, later a false prophet and now, at the age of 52 years, he had become a sexual robot full of lust. After the hard work of many years of robbing, torturing and killing so many people, he wanted to make his sexual life happy. Sex and lust were two chapters of his life that he had forgotten about during his struggle to become rich and powerful. But now, when he had everything, his sexual desires were awakened. Despite the fact that he was 52 years old and it wouldn't be long before he left this world. During the wars, they killed Jews and Christians and Muhammad took the women of these victims captive. He would select the most attractive women for himself and give the others to his team. These women became Muhammad's slaves. He made them dance. He forced them to give him sexual pleasure by threatening them with the sword. And after he had used them, he would throw them out into the street. Women had become a toy for Muhammad. He didn't value or respect them. For him, women were to be used and then thrown out. That is what he taught all of the men who followed him. For that reason, even today in the Islamic world women don't have the same rights or respect as men. Today in the Islamic world, women are subjected to discrimination and tortured by men. Muhammad liked to play with women for a little while and then he would treat them like slaves. With those whom he liked to spend a lot of time with, he would threaten to kill them if they didn't agree to marry him. In the following years, he married several times, divorcing the ones he was no longer interested in so that he could marry others. The Quran and history tells us that Muhammad was married 11 times. But according to the signs and indications, Muhammad was married many more times. Even on some occasions, he had been married several times within a week or even a month. Some people even dared to question him about his sexual and marital activities 
But there's a saying, every dog has its day, which means that there's always a moment in life when everything goes very well. This saying can be perfectly applied to Muhammad. He knew how to justify his horrible actions and evil activities. Islam served as a shield for him. Each time that he married another woman, he would say that it was Allah's wish and that Allah had commanded him to marry that woman. When he mentioned the name of Allah, no one dared to question him. On top of that, he added another false message in the Quran. Man can be married to four women at a time. This was another way to legalize his sexual activities. Besides his first wife Khadija, in the following years, Muhammad married the following woman. Second, Sauda bint Zama. Third, Aisha. She was the third and most questionable wife of Muhammad, daughter of his best friend Abu Bakr, a six years old minor girl who was engaged to a young fellow, Jubair ibn Mutim. But like always, Muhammad's sexual desires were awoken and he devised a trick to get this girl. Breaking of the commitment that had been made between these two young people. Muhammad was 52 years old when he married this minor girl. Fourth, Hafsa bint Umar. Fifth, Umm Salama Hind. Sixth, Zainab bint Kuzaima. She was a Jew whose father, husband and uncle were all assassinated by Muhammad's Islamic army. Seven, Zainab bint Jash. She was the wife of Muhammad's adopted son. In other words, his daughter-in-law. Muhammad used tricks by inventing a false message from Allah and forcing his son to divorce his wife so that he could marry her himself. 8. Juwaria bint al-Haris 9. Safiya bint Huyai She was a 17 years old Jewish girl. Muhammad killed her father her husband Kinana and her brother all in the same day and raped her that very night. Tenth, Barra bint al Harit alias Maimuna. Eleven, Umm Habiba. Muhammad had sexual relations with almost whoever he wanted. Thanks to the supposed interest that Allah had in his sexual life, who would give him orders to marry one and then another. Muhammad sexually exploited young girls, had many women as slaves and countless wives. Muhammad never forgot to justify his dark sexual activities using Quran as a shield saying that all of his marriages were for the good of humanity and was helping the widows. But in reality, it was Muhammad himself who used to kill the husbands of those women and later raping them and forcing them to marry him. Muhammad was never able to pacify his hatred and anger in his heart against women. To him, it seemed as if all women were bad and cruel like his aunt. And because of that, he wanted to get revenge from all of them. He used to find the face of his aunt in the face of every woman.
and that is why through all of his writings and commands he sentenced women to a very difficult life through his religious orders discrimination against women is expressed in several ways like the following one Muslim man can be married to four women at the same time but women do not have the right to protest or marry more than one man at a time two Muhammad made it so easy for men to destroy the life of their women for example a Muslim man at any moment without any warning preparation or legal process can divorce his wife within some seconds just by repeating the word talaq three times which means divorce but a woman doesn't have it that easy if she wants to divorce her husband first of all islamic society doesn't allow her to do so and if she still wants her freedom by being a rebel she will have to go through a long and painful process but later after being divorced she will not have the same respect in society as before Muhammad did not give permission to women to enter the graveyard despite the fact that if a woman died she could be buried there however it was always the man who carried her body to the holy field for burial Muhammad did not believe that women were intelligent or that their word had any value it is for that reason that in the Islamic laws which Muhammad invented the testimony of a woman is not valid for example if a woman has been raped and she reports it to the police that report cannot be processed until at least one man testifies to her word by doing all these things Muhammad left women sentenced to suffer forever that is why we now cannot change or better the situation for them because women already have their future and destiny decided by Muhammad via the Quran and the Quran is a book which doesn't allow modifications or changes in it after winning the wars Muhammad and his team used to capture the buildings of the cities and converted them into mosques and in them they built tall minarets that according to Muhammad were signs of victory for Islam the mosques were not a place to pray they were huge offices of his conquest of the world in which the minarets demonstrated his power Muhammad invented his own Islamic flag with the image of a sword this symbol means that all have to fear the sword and the power of Muhammad with this sword Muhammad assassinated and threatened the world in order to make them submit to Islam this image of the sword still exists on the national flag of Saudi Arabia where Muhammad was born where the lie about Islam and his war against humanity was started from Muhammad declared that whoever wasn't a Muslim couldn't enter into the Kaaba which is called the home of Allah the message of Muhammad was very clear all those who are not Muslims are enemies of Muhammad and his followers through the Quran which is a creation of Muhammad he left a very clear message to all the Muslims that they should not have any friendship or relationship with the kafirs people who are not Muslims Muhammad never allowed anyone to oppose him this meant losing your life several people from his group that rebelled against him were brutally assassinated by Muhammad and until today Muslims continue with the same ideology according to them whoever decides to abandon oppose or criticize Islam will be assassinated in the year 632 at the age of 62 Muhammad died but before leaving this world he left so much radicalism and violence in the heart of Muslims that we can never erase or change it 
although Muhammad died, his followers, political alliances, and team of criminals continued to commit all of the injustices, tortures, and massacres that he had taught them. And it wasn't because of their faith in Islam or out of respect of Muhammad. It was because they were not capable of living without the luxury and power coming from the lie of the faith of Islam that Muhammad had created. From then on, this false faith has extended throughout the world and still continues with its ideology of governing the world at whatever price and whatever way. People who were converted to Islam by force continued in the Islamic trap because of fear of Muhammad. And so, from generation to generation time passed. Things of the past were forgotten and the new generation didn't realize that they were following a religion that was erected from the graves of many innocent men and that they respected a religion that was surrounded by a sea of tears from countless women. They continued to respect Muhammad as the messenger of Allah and Islam as a religion which their past generations had given to them. They never came to realize the history or the reality of how Muhammad killed and brutally tortured people in order to convert them to a religion that didn't even exist. And since that time until now, millions of innocent Muslims follow the violent education and injustice of Islam that Muhammad imposed on them. These Muslims of blind faith do not know that they are the descendants of generations of people who were forced to convert to Islam and they follow a religion which is the creation of a selfish mafia man who created this Islamic trap in order to gain power and luxury. We understand perfectly that Muhammad lived through a terrible situation in his childhood and youth without parents, without love and without means for a better life which were facts that caused him to become a criminal and a very selfish person who did everything that he could to fulfill his own interests. Any one of us in his position could have ended up down the same path. Everyone in the world likes money and power. But now it is the moment to recognize him, to know his lies, to recognize his character and the fantasy of Islam which he created. Muhammad himself couldn't have imagined that a false faith invented by him in order to rule on the world would have grown so much and would be followed by millions of people who admire and respect his lies with so much devotion and sincerity. What has happened to the millions of people who can't distinguish between the truth and lie? Why can't they see that Muhammad was only a human being like us who committed all of these crimes because of his human nature desiring power and wealth? I know that I haven't got physical evidences to prove that Muhammad wasn't a prophet, but rather a mobster. But Muslims can't demonstrate either the truthfulness of Muhammad's sacred and spiritual character. Very simply, I just want to say, how can a man be a prophet who used to rape women, abused young children, killed innocent people in the name of a faith, ruined the future of families, and led his followers to the barbarism? If he was still alive, I'm sure that no law, no country or culture would let him remain free, and that he would be punished for all the crimes he committed against humanity. I would ask all Muslims to please leave the way of jihad which Muhammad taught them and that they should embrace the way of love and humanity. That will be the true salvation for them and peace for this world.
God created the angels, and the man. Satan lied to some of the angels, and made them demons. And Satan lied to Adam and Eve, and made them mankind. Allah is Satan, not God. Quran, Azariah 51:56. And I, Allah, made the demons and mankind that they should worship me, alone. Quran, Azariah 51:56. Muhammad told his wife about seeing the devil in a cave, but his Catholic wife told him that this must be Angel Gabriel, and that he must be a prophet. We can't deny the truth, Muslim is an Arabic word which means submit not to God, but to Allah. All Muslims are going to hell fire, Quran, Surat 1970-72. May Jesus the Lord guide you and protect you from cultic antichrist teachings like Muhammad's lies. J it is doubtful that anyone can take care about love or understand us like our own parents. Although he lived with his uncle, he didn't have many freedoms and was constantly mistreated. His aunt treated him very badly. She frequently hit him and when it came time to eat, she treated him in a very derogatory manner saying, Besides the fact that I have such a big family, I also have to feed this trash? Muhammad listened in silence and endured everything without understanding why he was to blame, why he had to face such a cruel situation. In his heart, a volcano of vengeance, anger and resentment began to erupt towards his situation, against the world and especially against women, because of the abuse he had received from his aunt. This difficult situation in the majority of cases causes a child to be distracted and have low self-esteem. Muhammad realized that he was an orphan without a future and the world revolved around money and power. But for the moment he had no other option but to continue living with his uncle's family. No one is born a criminal neither does anyone want to live like one. Delinquency in the majority of the cases is a consequence of a life filled with difficulties and deficiencies. But when Muhammad turned 8 years old, his grandfather also died, once again leaving him all alone. His uncle Abu Talib took him in to live with him. He was also very poor and had a very large family. Muhammad, in order to help sustain the family, had to work as a shepherd, a clerk in the store, collector and helper in caravans. Normally, at 8 years of age, most children are having fun, playing and don't even have to worry about problems or difficulties of any kind. However, Muhammad, as a poor child, had to work hard and face many difficulties. Growing up in this kind of difficult situation brought him great sadness, feelings of loneliness and lack of self-esteem. When he used to see other children of his age, he felt very sorry and longed for his parents. He thought and wished that he too could have a father who would play with him, take him for walk and buy him toys. Oh, how he wished he had a mother to love him, care for him, give him hugs and kisses and to take care of him when he was sick, to feed him and cry for him when he is hurt. The poor child would just go to the corner to cry because there wasn't anyone to whom he could express his feelings. Become successful. Muhammad's strategy was very clear. 
success, power, and money at whatever price. And it didn't matter what had to be done to obtain this objective. They studied and investigated all of the options. They realized that Jews and Christians who were very rich and powerful in politics, religion, and society governed the world. They should be attacked, robbed, and taken away their money. Having money in your pocket, power would come by itself. But how to do that? To go into their houses and rob them wouldn't be easy because there were many of them and they would respond in the same violent way. So they decided to rob them when they could catch them alone in the streets, the desert or their stores covering their faces with a veil. In the next five years, Muhammad's group became very violent, attacking and robbing Jews and Christians. They assaulted them, beat them, and if they resisted, they would even kill them. Words like sympathy, love, and friendship didn't exist in the dictionary of Muhammad's life. For him, everything was a question of how he could obtain it all. They would grab them on the pathways and in the streets of the towns, except for in Mecca, where they didn't use it. The 29th of April, a child was born, Muhammad, in the family of Amina, the widow of Abdullah. She was a poor woman without any type of economic means or fixed income. Abdullah died shortly before the birth of Muhammad. Amina for being very poor, sought help and found refuge with Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Muhammad, who was a generous man, although he had gone through some economic difficulties too. This situation was very difficult for the mother and her son. Amina couldn't feed her son except for just a few weeks and had to look for a Bedouin wet nurse by the name of Halima bin Zueb who was very poor and lived in the valley of desert. Halima took care of and loved Muhammad. She nursed him, tried to give him good food and played with the poor child who had lost his father and was separated from his mother. She tried to keep him happy every way that she could, but because she was poor, she couldn't give him everything what he wanted. When he turned five years old, Amina, the mother of Muhammad, came back, longing for him. Halima, although sad, understood the feelings of Amina and gave the child back to his mother. A short time later, Amina got sick and died, leaving Muhammad an orphan at six years of age. His grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, stayed with him. This poor child was raised in this situation, little by little causing him to think like a criminal. At 20 years old, he left his uncle's family since he already had made many friends. So he left to live life on his own. He felt prepared to begin his new life and to become successful as he had many times dreamed. He always said to his friends, One day I'll be a king and I'll rule the whole world. Everyone will respect me, whether because they love me or because they fear me. It really doesn't matter. Besides the fact that he didn't have a single penny in his pocket, his anger kept him full of energy and pushed him with an unstoppable force. He didn't want to continue his life as just a worker. He wanted to be rich and powerful. But how? What did you have to do to be rich and powerful? Muhammad didn't have any money to invest into a business, nor family that could support him financially so that he could better his standard of living. 
The dream of becoming rich and powerful without any money in his pocket and without a roof over his head, it was almost impossible to become true. After some time passed, Muhammad formed a group of young people who were almost in the same situation like him. They accepted him as their leader and administrator. They began to plan ways to